All right, I hope you have a Bible with you. If you don't, there are pew Bibles there and make it easy for you. It's just about in the middle of your Bible this time. This is the 119th Psalm. Now, over the last uh, several months, we did summer in the Psalms. We have been in the Psalms. There are 150 of them. It's the longest book in the Bible. Today, we're going to look at the longest chapter in the Bible. It's a good way to conclude the series in the Psalms. It's also a great way to anticipate what we're going to begin next week, the journey with Walk Through the Bible. How many of you have been a part of a Walk Through the Bible event at some point? Any of you? Okay, several of you. Thank you. We had several in the first hour, too, but most not. Uh, Next Sunday, we're going to kick off some multi-week ministry. We're coordinating with Walk Through the Bible with uh, an introduction of a guest speaker next Sunday morning. We're going to give you a taste of what we'll be doing Sunday afternoon. I want to encourage you to come back Sunday afternoon, because Sunday afternoon, uh, we're going to do the whole Old Testament. But it's a creative presentation of how to understand how the pieces of the puzzle in the Bible all fit together. And that Old Testament can be kind of cloudy for a lot of people, and that becomes a an obstacle to engaging with it fully. So we want to eliminate as many of those obstacles as we can. So what we're doing, uh, I'll be preaching about it on Sundays. You'll be studying it in your Bible fellowship groups. During the week, you'll have devotionals that'll lead toward what you're going to do in your Bible fellowship groups, your Sunday school classes. All of us pointing in the same direction at the same time, focused on the Old Testament, the story And finding Jesus everywhere in the Old Testament, which is a key part of what we want to accomplish in this. And what we found through a whole series of studies about spiritual growth, spiritual engagement with God's people in church is there's nothing that contributes more consistently, more thoroughly, more uh, with as a greater catalyst for spiritual growth than ongoing engagement with the word of God, the Bible. And that makes this a big deal. It's, it's the one thing that someone who maybe doesn't even know God, but they start reading the Bible. Someone who's a new Christian, they start reading the Bible. Someone who's been a Christian for a little while, they start engaging fully with the Bible. People who've been a believer for a long time, fully developing, devoted followers of Christ. The thing that grows them too is the Bible. So we want to get everybody into the Bible. Now, some of you, you've been with me for a while, a few years, and you say, Oh, look, Chad's going to talk about the Bible. Well, that never happened before. I think I've heard what Chad has to say about the Bible because I've heard these sermons multiple times over multiple years. Well, here's the deal. When everybody's doing it, I'll stop preaching about it. When everybody's engaged with the Bible on an ongoing basis, we'll talk about other things too. But we're going to keep this on the menu on an ongoing basis. And some of you have played this game with me before. What is the most popular flavor of ice cream in the world? Biggest seller ever, vanilla, good old vanilla. What's number two? Chocolate. Chocolate's number two. Way less than vanilla as far as popularity, as far as total sales. Now, I know a lot of you have your favorite that's not chocolate or vanilla. It's some uh, fancied up uh, blue bell concoction of some sort or another. But they're light years behind even chocolate. So if you could only sell one kind of ice cream flavor in the world, what flavor would you sell? You would sell vanilla because that's where the money is. Well, here's the deal. When it comes to spiritual growth, there are a lot of different things that will move you toward Christ. There are a lot of different things that will move you forward in spiritual development, move you in discipleship. But if, if we could just sell one thing, if we could just promote one thing, if we could just get you to engage in one thing, you know what it would be? It would be the Bible. And so this gives us an opportunity to unlock some of the obstacles to the Old Testament and maybe unlock two-thirds of the Bible to you, maybe for the first time where you really get the flow of it and the whole counsel of God's Word comes to play in your life. Now, Jesus said, that's a good way to talk about the Bible. Jesus said, If you continue in my word, you really are my disciples, John 8. If you continue in the word, you really are my disciples. Jesus did not say, if you have a copy of God's word, gathering dust on your shelf, that shows you really are my disciples. If you have a big old family Bible laying out on a coffee table in your living room, that shows you really are, you really are my disciples. He didn't say, if... uh, 
if in your 20s you were really into God's Word and you learned a lot then, or in your 30s you were developing a lot and you were growing a lot and you were teaching a class and so you got a lot of Bible into you, then you're really my disciple, even if you've, you've kind of dropped the ball on that the last several decades. He said, if you continue in my Word, if you ongoing stay engaged with my Word, then you really are my disciples. This isn't, this isn't just a, oh, it's a good habit to read the Bible. It's a sign of whether or not you belong to Christ. How about that? This is one of the evidences the Bible gives of, and there's several of different ones of this is how you know you're one of his children. And one of them is you're engaging with the word of God. So this week, what I want us to do is to grow our heart for the word of God and to look at how we can integrate God's word into every area of our lives, okay? Now that word integrate, you know what integration is? It's the opposite of segregation. Segregation says we're going to divide into different groups. We're going to, sp- we're going to sp- spread out the pieces of our pie so they're all uh, standalone pieces of the pie. When you segment your life, you live a segregated life. And when the pieces of the pie, uh, you-, you look at them and you say, okay, this is my personal life. This is my church life. This is my work life. This is my family life. This is my social life. This is my sex life. It's all separated out into its own convenient compartments. You have segmented your life. You live a a segregated life. And that's different than an integrated life. Uh, Because that means you lack integrity. Same, Same word, integrity, integration. To have integrity means you live a life that's integrated as a whole. It means... uh, When you're with your church friends, you act a certain way. And when you're with uh, your friends on a Tuesday night uh, from work, you're a different person. Well, that's a segregated life, not an integrated life. You're a different person depending on who you're with. You're a different person at your Bible study group that you get together with, men's or women's group. You're a different person there than you are when you're at home. You live a segregated life. And a lot of people do that. They compartmentalize and spread it out. Do things in different ways, different places. Psalm 119 verse 1, this is from the New Living Translation, says, How joyful are people of integrity. They live the integrated life. That God's word is not just a part of their life. It permeates everything about life. And you're the same person wherever people find you. And that's the kind of life I want to live. It's the kind of life I want you to live. The kind of life God wants you to live. And to do that, you need to become a man, a woman of the word. Uh, And here's the thing about that. It's not going to happen if you don't desire it. And sometimes when my desiring is not strong, I have to ask God. God, create the desire in me. And he does. He's super faithful in that kind of stuff. Help me to want what you want for me. Because the default setting of our life is never going to be toward obedience to God, faithfulness to God, or engagement with his word. You're never going to drift into spiritual growth. Spiritual growth happens because you have an intention to grow spiritually. That's true for any place where you want to grow in your life. You don't get better at your job by just drifting through. You you focus on it. You, You prepare for it. You seek to... Increase your skill set in your area of expertise. That's how you grow. Same thing in spiritual things. It starts with a desire. Now, the 119th Psalm. And uh, just to kick us off, out of uh, about the middle of this 176 verses or so. uh, Not the exact middle, but a pretty good way to start is 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. The 119th Psalm is, is an amazing piece of poetry. That's one of the things that we don't always appreciate. There are all these words, and uh, some of it we don't see as much in the translation. Some of your translations are going to have some extra notations on the 119th Psalm. And here's how it's structured. It's divided into 22 different stanzas. Each stanza has eight verses. Each stanza, every verse in that stanza starts with the same Hebrew letter. Remember, Hebrew is the original language of uh, the Old Testament. It starts with the same Hebrew letter. And so it's carefully planned, carefully structured. So the first eight verses 
uh, Aleph, first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, every one of those verses begins with the same Hebrew letter. And then, and then Bet, and the second set of eight, uh, Gamil, Daleth, and right on through your Hebrew alphabet, uh, it, it's structured in that way. So, especially for the original readers, beautiful, beautiful poetry. It's, it's not only the longest of the Psalms, the longest chapter in the Bible, 176 verses, it's also the one that just most directly deals with the Word of God. Almost every one of these verses says something about, uh, about God's Word, God's law. Now, the scholarly folks who compare vocabulary and structure and writing styles and all that sort of stuff, even though it's not attributed directly to David in print, we believe David wrote it, and there are multiple reasons why that's so, but that's how I'm going to talk about it going forward today, that this is from David. He used a variety of terminology to refer back to this book, so almost every verse is going to say something directly about the Word of God, that it's, he's going to say commandments, laws, statutes, precepts, ordinances, rules, words, testimonies, all referring to the Scriptures as they existed in David's day which is 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. Correct? Uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, we can, we can take application. We can apply it to all those places. But when David wrote this, he's referring to the first five books in the Bible. The books of Moses, the books of the law, the Pentateuch. For five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We certainly make application beyond that, but that's our place to start as we look at the 119th. Now, here's the thing about what David says. By the way, you guys were even rougher on uh, not even blinking when I said it was uh, related to the last uh, four books of the Bible. Man, uh, maybe we should stop and pray. The 119th is a great example of Scripture talking about Scripture, and that happens multiple times in the Bible, but the 119th is all dedicated to that. It's God's, it's the Word, God's Word about God's Word. And we find David interacting, and this is how we're going to break this up. It's a big, it's a big old book, and I'll reference a lot of verses. It's, uh, it's a story of how David interacted with God's Word. Because it's not just, again, having it on a shelf at your house. It's how you work with the Word. And here are the five things that I see characteristic of all believers, and not just for the first five books of the Bible, but for the whole 66. Here's the first thing. If you're really going to connect with God's Word, you're going to have to trust the Word of God. Time and time again, David just expresses he believes the Scriptures are true, verse 151. He believes them uh, fully, 66. He trusts in their reliability, 42, and he calls them in 160, the sum of your word is truth. This, the whole thing, this, this book you have entrusted to us, your word, it is true. Now, this first step is key because if you don't regard the word of God as fully and entirely trustworthy, then none of the other steps are likely to be followed well. And this is why we're quick to deal with those criticisms. That's why there's, there's a whole discipline of apologetics that just says the Bible is reliable. The Bible is trustworthy. Just a few weeks ago, there was a, there's a well-known Christian musician and songwriter who on his Twitter feed came out and said, you know, I really think Christianity is just uh, another religion. So I'm kind of wavering on how I feel about all of it. He's still going to make a buck off a Christian selling this stuff, but... Uh, he said, I, I really don't think it's, because, you know, people, there are so many, the Bible's full of contradictions, but no one talks about it. First thing he said in the, in the, the note. Well, is that true? You've heard people say that, haven't you? Oh, the Bible's full of contradictions, you can't trust the Bible. Oh, the Bible's been disproven by history. Oh, the Bible's been disproven by, by archaeology, so you can't believe that. Are those things true? If someone, by the way, just for the, your garden variety person that you're going to run into, and they say, oh, the Bible's full of contradictions, so I don't believe the Bible, just ask them, tell me where. What you'll find out is they just heard that from somebody somewhere, or they read it on a Twitter feed from some nut who's writing Christian, Christian music. That is not so. 
In fact, the Sunday, this is the 25th of October, the Sunday after we finish our walk through the Bible run, we're going to do a short series uh, of apologetics and just talk about some of these things that are regular charges against God, against the Bible, against the Christian faith that are easily refuted. There is a well, the guy said no one's talking about Bible full of contradictions. Well, it's going to take me uh, almost five minutes to refute that entire argument on the 25th because it's easy to refute. It's easy to knock down. Uh, but, well, I heard that. You can trust the Bible. You can trust the Bible. Why do you trust the Bible? Well, because it's God's Word and God's just not going to guide you in the wrong direction. People will. Have any of you, any of you ever gotten bad advice from somebody? Anybody? Anybody you're sitting next to that gave you that bad advice? You'd like to... <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah, some of you are going to deal with that at lunch, aren't you? That's just going to be ugly for many of you. Jimmy's available for some group counseling after we're done. Yeah. Uh, I mean, well-meaning people, good people, uh, have given me bad advice over time and uh, wrong advice. Here's the thing. God's just never going to do that. God is not going to give you a bad word, a bad advice, a bad, good, bad direction. He's always going to give you the right way, the best way. And uh, if you do that, it's going to cause a lot less problems. That, that verse again, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I, I need, if I'm, in a, if I'm in the dark, and again, I have pretty good uh, night blindness, so I'm not much good in the dark, so I'll turn on lights. And uh, I've been in this building before, even before I was having some of my vision problems. Come in here just to get something. I think, well, I don't want to turn on this whole thing to find my Bible that I left on the front pew after Sunday. It is really dark in here. And uh, ultimately, if I don't have my phone with me with my little flashlight, I'm just going to go back and I'm going to turn on some lights, lest I... Uh, just injure myself permanently. I've also tried to climb down from the stairs in the dark, coming in from the side. That's a bad plan too. You don't want you don't want to bump into things in the darkness, and also you need you need God to light the path in front of you, so you know which way to go. And it's just a great verse, the flashlight verse of the Bible. Yours is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. It shows me which way to go, and it protects me from danger. Uh, when you think about this. You in the dark on anything today? You say, well, I'm not sure what God's will for me is with my job. I'm not sure about this relationship and where this needs to go. I need some, I need some clarity on, on a decision I need to make. I, I, need, I need to understand the, the darkness that's going on inside of me that I need to I need just get some light on. Here's the thing. God's word is good for all those things, helpful in all those things, and true in all those things, what you do, where you go, and maybe, maybe you just pray, God, you said in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path, and God, I'm just asking you to keep your promise in that, and I want to read your word, and I'm asking you to speak to me, to shine the light in the dark places where I need some light. Here's the second thing I find with David is he's studying the Word of God. He doesn't just believe the Word. He's a student of the Word. Verse 73, he learns it. Verse 155, he seeks it. Uh, 153, he memorizes it. And there are multiple, multiple verses where said he meditates on it. It means he just lets it stew a little bit. He, he focuses on it and he says, I'm going to keep thinking about that, keep thinking about that, keep thinking about that. But, it's not just a casual glancing blow at the Word of God. He's digging in to this book because it's the Word of God. This step ought to naturally follow the first one. If God's Word is really true, we ought to commit ourselves to be students of the Word, studiers of the Word, to embrace it with our... This is the part we say, oh, I believe God's Word. I believe it's true. I fully embrace that here. But you can fully embrace it here too. You can, with your heart, with your mind, you don't have to check your brains at the door to be a follower of the God who inspired this book. The Bible is often referred to, when the Bible refers to it internally, as a seed. The seed of the Word of God. 
And that seed needs some good soil to be planted in. It needs, uh, it needs some soft soil, some productive soil. And when the seed of the word of God finds good soil, it will grow and produce fruit. And maybe that's the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Maybe it's, maybe it's people coming to know Christ who didn't know Christ. The eternal fruit of souls being saved. It's, it's the fruit of spiritual growth. It's all those things when you give it some good soil to land in. And in order to have that, one of the things you have to have is you have to have an open heart. You have to have a receptive heart. You need a repentant heart that's a good soil for the word of God to touch into. Now, Psalm 119, 18 is uh, this morning I read uh, four chapters out of the gospel according to Luke. And I started the way I've been starting for a long time. I quote Psalm 119, open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. God, I don't know what I'm about to run into that you want to say to me. I don't know where you're going to really shine the spotlight in what I'm going to read today, but I'm asking you to shine it brightly because I sure don't want to miss whatever it is you have to say to me today. I have read those four chapters hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. But what's the word for today? Don't let me miss it. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. And there are wonderful things in God's word, but you can't see them unless God shines a light and illuminates them. So ask him to. Trust him to. The Bible tells us the word of God is spiritual food for a spiritual life. And you need that kind of thing. The Bible describes itself, uh, some of those other images, water, milk, bread, meat of the spiritual life. Your physical body needs physical food. Your spiritual body needs spiritual food. And you have to be feeding yourself constantly and all the time. You can't spiritually starve yourself and be a growing, fully developing follower of Christ. Yet we got a lot of starving people. So, well, I come to church, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good for two, uh, two Sundays a month or one Sunday a month. Or, uh, and I have a devotional that I read or I listen to somebody. I'm, I'm catching bits and pieces here and there, but... But are you a self-feeder? Boy, I really want you to be a self-feeder. Uh, they're wonderful expositors of God's word. God has a word for you personally. And are, are you spending time in God's word that God could speak to you? And are you doing it regularly? Are you spiritually starved? Sometimes you can go a long time between spiritual feedings. And how does that work? If, you, if you're running a construction crew and uh, you have a guy... He comes up, he says, hey, you look kind of peaked today. What's going on? He says, well, I haven't eaten in two weeks. Okay, well, listen, here are the keys to the bulldozer. What could go wrong with that? I'm going to turn you loose. Why don't you climb the scaffolding and go do what you do way up high? I'm sure you'll be fine. You're commanding soldiers. You say, hey, you don't look too good. Well, I haven't eaten in a month. Just haven't felt like it. Okay, well, listen, here's... Here's everything you need to go into battle. I'm sure you'll be fine. No. You'd want them to be fueled and, and well-fed and good to go. And the same is true. You are going into a difficult world out there. It's ugly. It's broken. You're going to be under attack. And you just need to be at your best. And if you're going to be at your best, you're going to have to have your spiritual feeding all locked away. We need to be feeding ourselves on God's word. There's a verse uh, we looked at uh, actually a couple of weeks ago in here. The Bible says, let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom. Let it move into you. Let it inhabit you. Let it take up residence in you. Not just, again, it's on my shelf. Uh, I, sometimes I, I get a, a little uh, verse with a background on it. And man, now I've been in God's word today. Lean and study this book. Make it a part of you. Third thing is using the Word of God. Now, it's one thing to believe the Word of God, to know the Word of God. It's another thing to apply it to your life, and we certainly want to get to that. We want to look at it as a guide for the difficulties and challenges, for hope and encouragement, all the things that we need as we go through life. David repeatedly affirms he uses the Word of God as his counselor, verse 24. His strength, verse 28. Comfort in affliction, verse 50. Of course, a light, a lamp, verse 105. And he says, it's just the source of my life. Uh, verse 156. The source of my life. I, I read a book this summer, my summer reading program. 
I pull in different things and I read a book, hadn't, it's been a few years, on the attributes of God. This is who God is. This is God's character. This is the things you, that, are, that make, make up the, the person of God. And so we talk about the attributes of God. Well, they're attributes of Scripture. Here's the interesting thing about that. Many of the things that are attributes of God are attributes of Scripture because the Scriptures are the Word of God. So you're going to see the things of God being on display in the Word of God. Now, the thing about this Word of God, it's not stale and stagnant sitting on this page. It is more than that. It is, it is true, but it is living and it is active, the Bible says, of itself. Living, active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It, it's not... It's not just sitting out here. It's alive. And it wants to be a part of your life. Uh, <laughs> I, I, was, I told the first crowd, I'll do better with you, but I'm still going to confess my sins. I was uh, working on this last night, and I thought, okay, so it's true. Well, there are a lot of things that are true that, that aren't really life-changing, not alive. And so then I thought, okay, well, let's see. Uh, you know, encyclopedia is true, but it's not alive. And I thought, man, that statement means I'm old. Encyclopedia? Boy. I got to think, okay, well, a phone book is true. Oh, ooh, man, phone book. Anybody have a phone book? No, it's not so much. Um, so I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with a dictionary, which is online, but, you know, at least it's still a dictionary. You can call it that, not be embarrassed. Uh, by your age, a, a, a dictionary can be true. But a living book is a different thing. And here's the thing about the Bible. And when you open your Bible, I hope that you'll lean into this. I hope that you will feel this. That the Bible is the place where the God of the universe meets with us and manifests himself to us and speaks to us. That's what the Bible is. With trembling hands, you open this book anticipating that the God of the universe is about to speak. So I want to make the Bible my foundation for life. You know, whatever, whatever your foundation is determines what kind of building you can build on it, how big the building can build. Uh, Jesus talked about it this way, end of the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And you remember how he goes. And then there's a wise man builds a house on a rock. Another guy, he builds his house on the sand. And rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the rock stood firm. And the house on the sand went splat. Thank you. That's a good Bible word, splat. House on the sand went splat. What do you want to build? What do you want to grow in your life? What do you want to develop? What do you want to reflect of Christ, of the glory of God you need a firm foundation upon which to stand. I'm going to build my life on the word of God and his truth. If you, if you build your life on the rock of truth, here's the great part about it. The Bible, God's word, God, the Bible says God's word is truth. If you build your life on that, here's the great part. True, what is true was true a thousand years ago. What is true is going to be true a thousand years from now. It doesn't change. That's the nature of truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. It doesn't change. Jesus isn't the way to God uh, today, but it's not going to be, no, he's going to be other ways to God tomorrow. There's one way, because Jesus is the truth, and truth is narrow, defined, focused. I want to build my life on something that's going to last. So maybe you just need to say, God, I'm going to build my life on the truth of this book, the foundation stones of this book. Christ is my Savior. God, the, God is my, you're my Lord, Holy Spirit, my power. And truthfully, you know, most of us would also say, honest with ourselves with God, I don't understand everything about why you say the things you say, why you expect the things you expect. And sometimes they make me uncomfortable. And sometimes they get into my business but I'm going to trust that your word is true and I'm going to build my life on that which does not change because it is truth. Most people aren't doing that. 
Most people are building their life like my career. I mean, it's all about my career. It's all about this relationship. And if I can just get this relationship established, then everything's going to be awesome with this person, with this group of people. And we build on shifting sands that change that we cannot control that are not eternal and not truth. Now our culture, crowd, tradition, how we feel in the moment. Here's what I think. Here's what I feel. Here's what I believe. And it's not based on the Bible. Let's build our foundation on God's Word. Fourth thing, delighting in the Word of God. What's amazing about what David says, he takes things a, a step further. He says, it's not just that he trusts God's Word. It's not just that he studies God's Word. He uses the Word of God, but he has, he has an affection for it. Now, this is something we don't get into much. He has an affection. There's an emotional affinity for the Word of God. It, it touches more than his intellect and more than his crisis of need in any given moment. It's deep within him. Uh, verse 159, he loves God's word. 162, he rejoices in it. Uh, 18, it's wondrous. Uh, 72, it's better than thousands of gold and silver pieces. And uh, 103, it's sweeter than honey in my mouth. He loves this book. And I'm convinced that this is probably the missing piece for most believers today. Because we, we view the Bible in this utilitarian fashion that says, this is a handy tool when I need a tool. It's like my hammer. My hammer's out in my toolbox in my garage. So if I need to drive a nail, I go get my hammer. If I need to open a bottle, I get my hammer. If I need to fix the ice maker, I get my hammer. My hammer works for just about everything I've found, one way or another. And we think about the Bible the same way. It's a tool I need when I need a tool. And until then, it's going to sit safely tucked away in my toolbox. But I know I need to. Chad tells me I do. My Sunday school teacher tells me I do. Pastor growing up told me I needed to do this. So I'm going to do it. And it's like me this morning. Rhonda won't let me eat uh, Flintstones chewables anymore. She makes me eat these old adult vitamins. They're supposed to be good for the elderly. And so I take my vitamin every morning. It's my medicine. I have to take my medicine. I read my Bible because I'm just supposed to do it. That's not how David approaches this book. He approaches it with his passion and zeal and excitement. This is the word of God. And, and the reason for this is not hard. Why he says, I love this law. I love what God has to say to me. I love the message of the book. See, it reflects God's nature. It reflects God's purposes. It reflects God's character. It reflects God's will. Because the deal is, see, I love this book. David really, really loved this book because he loved God. And that's what the book is about. It's about how much we love God. And if you love God, don't you want to talk to him? I look forward to talking to Rhonda. We go to the gym early and we come back and we just talk during breakfast and getting ready to the beginning of our day, end of our day. We talk, we download the day and I want to hear how her day went. She wants to hear how my day went. And I love spending time with her and talking to her and hearing hearing what's happening with her because I love her and she loves me God loves you you engage with God's word because you love him a Christian who says I, oh I love God I'm all I'm all about God I love Jesus is my savior I love I just don't I just don't care about this book that's a segregated life again and that's a problem at the heart of uh, our heart to love God is to love his word and this is the last thing, and you sure can't pass this one up. These first four characteristics, uh, they have to lead here. And this is where it breaks down for a lot of people. Obeying the word of God. David repeatedly expresses his desire to actually do this stuff. He wants to keep it. He wants to follow it. He wants to fulfill it. Not just study it. He, he wants to live out what God has said. That integrity, what I say... What I, say, I, what I say about my relationship to God is actually lived out in my life in all circles. Now, in our world today, I know the concept of obeying the Word of God, because God does say a lot about 
Okay, don't do this. Do this. This is sin. This is what holiness looks like. And he spells that out. And people say, oh, I'm under grace. I'm not under the law. I don't have to do all the, all the, uh, all the details, all the ups and downs, the yes and no, the right, the wrong. I don't have to worry about that because I'm under grace. And there are two things to be kept in mind. Uh, David didn't do this because he, uh, he was trying to earn God's favor. He didn't do this to, man, we don't do this to be saved. We, don't do, we do these things because we are saved. We obey God because we love God. We do the things that God says because He is Savior and He is Lord as we have declared it. Second reason is, remember this, Jesus was really good at obeying the law. He cared about it. He listened to it. He obeyed it fully. He did that for us. In every degree, at every turn, Jesus completely fulfilled the requirements of the law. And that's what made him the sinless Savior who could die on the cross for us. So Jesus thought it was a big deal to obey in everything. The Word of God is not just food for our souls. It's our standard for living. It just establishes, here's what it looks like. You, you don't self-identify, self-define what a relationship to God looks like. God has said, this is what a relationship to me that's, that's going the way it's supposed to. That's living out what I have commanded. This is what it looks like. And that's what I want from you. Not just a little bit, but I want all those things. Because we said uh, last week, he's our creator. And if he's the creator, who knows better than him what we were created to do and to be and what our life is supposed to look like. And that's why we know the book, we live the book, and we obey what this book says. Because that's when God makes life work the way God intends for our lives to work. It's where your, your life is happy. It's when, when you need to make a decision. When, when you need to get away from what is wrong. It just creates the standard to say this is what it looks like. God didn't leave us guessing. Well I hope it works out. I hope I can figure out what I'm supposed to do. It's supposed to be. God knows. Psalm 1. How happy is the one. Who does not walk in the advice of the wicked. Or stand in the pathway of sinners. Or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. We often pray, dear God, please bless my life. Would you bless my life? Bless my family? Bless my kids? Bless my job? Bless, 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 bless. So that way I can feel honest when I say hashtag blessed on Twitter. Is that, uh, is that the beginning and end of that? You know, sometimes you have to position yourself to be blessable. And the blessable life is the obedient life. The blessed, the blessed life is a life that's saying, God's plan is my plan. And I'm going to follow it with all my heart for all of my days. That, that's how I want to live life. The word of God, it, just, it gives you hope in crisis and comfort and despair and strength when you're weak and wisdom when you're confused and guidance when you're looking for direction. And the word of God will give you strength to resist and fight even temptation to sin. The reason we break down our sins is because we don't know God's word. And we have not embraced God's word. The, the 11th verse. I have treasured your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. I've hidden your word in my heart. Not so I can be a goody two-shoes so people will think I'm just a little uh, halo wearing angel here on this earth. That's not one. I, I hid my word in my your, your, God, I put your word in my heart because I don't want to sin against you because I want your word to always be on me, in me, and speaking to me. That's handy for me. It's also handy if you hid God's word in your heart to be able to, at a moment's notice, be able to speak to the people that you're going to interact with that are far from God. People that maybe they're believers, but they're listening to the culture more than they're listening to the word of God to say, this is what the Word of God says. To be able to share it. Not to, not to use it as a weapon that you're just beating people over the head with it. But to use it as a guide. As a gentle reminder. As an encouragement. Uh, hide God's Word in your heart so it's always with you. So you have it. And so you can share it quickly, easily with others. Jesus. Think about the Word of God. Jesus embodies all five of these characteristics. He trusted God's Word. Studied it. Used it. Delighted in it. And he obeyed it. Uh, David challenges us to. And David sought to. Jesus did it to perfection. And this is what he calls us to. He calls us to do this well. 
to embrace it in all these ways, to interact with it on a daily basis in all these different levels, that the Word of God would transform us into the image of Christ who did it to perfection. I want to encourage you, challenge you in all these things. Now, one of the, one of the things about walk through the Bible that is helpful is that it develops a pattern of regular church attendance, hopefully, that, okay, I'm going to do this for the run. Uh, not just, uh, hey, I'm, I'm going to, you know, like we talked about, we do a series on the Ten Commandments, and if you're only here three Sundays out of ten, I hope you chose your commandments carefully, right? Well, sometimes we're missing out on things, so I really want to encourage, we can develop a pattern of, I'm going to be in God's house on God's day with God's people. Also, there's daily devotionals, so you can get in the habit over six weeks of spending time every day in God's Word, and because you're going to talk about that with your group, it also gets you in the habit of being in a group. If you're not in a group, you need to be for this, just this part. If you haven't been in one previously, you're not in one currently, you, 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 don't, you were in a group and you're not in one now, jump into one for this run to develop the habit also of community. Uh, there are lots of spiritual growth opportunities that are presented by something like this. Engaging with God's words at the core of that. So let's, uh, let's lean in this together because I think God has a lot of room to work in us as we do it together. And uh, if you've not signed up for the event next Sunday, I really want to encourage you to give it a whirl. Uh, I know that if the second coming of Christ was going to happen in our building after noon on Sunday, many of you would decline. Because if, well, once, once noon is done, I'm not coming back. Uh, and I say that somewhat facetiously, but not too much. Hey, you can make it through the afternoon. This is not just sitting in a lecture. It's going to be super interactive, a whole lot of fun. You need, to, you need to be a part of this. Over 300 people have already signed up to be a part of this, which is amazing for us because usually we're not early adopters on such things. But you've really jumped in big, and I appreciate that. If you have not already signed up, there's information in your program. We all have folks in the, uh, in the Rotunda area with cards and if you haven't signed up, they may ask you, hey, have you signed up? If not, here's the way to do it. And I hope you'll take one of those and you'll engage. This is engagement with the Word of God. When all of us start doing it together, there's a whole lot of room for God to do eternal things.